The first lesson is from John, chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. Listen now for a word from God for you today. Now, there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, how can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Our second reading this morning may be very familiar to some, but I hope today that you can hear it with an open heart and with fresh ears. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church today. Psalm 121. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where will my help come? My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. God will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. He who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. For the Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. God will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in. From this time on, and forevermore. Holy wisdom, holy word. I want you to remember back. It's August in 2009. Do you remember the fear of that time? In August 2009, a star-studded lineup of televangelists stood on stage at a Believer's Convention in Fort Worth, Texas before thousands of their followers. This, if you remember, think back, was at the heart of the Great Recession when so many were being weighed down by debt and by fears over the economy. And one after another, these preachers amazed the crowd with anecdotes of the luxurious lives that they had found just by following the word of God. They described private jets and yachts and vacations in Hawaii, and cruises in Alaska, and designer handbags and diamond rings. God knows where the money is, and he knows how to get the money to you. Actual quote from one of these preachers. Another taught, and this is still on their website. If you're like most Christians, you want to live a better life. You want better health, better finances, and better relationships. You're tired of dealing with the same problems day in and day out. Well, I've got some good news for you. 
Because the moment you accepted Jesus as Lord of your life, all the promises of God and the power of God have become available to you. If you have sufficient faith in God, they say, and donate generously to them, <laughs> these pastors guaranteed that God would multiply your offering by a hundredfold. And these were very reassuring promises in hard times. As the time came to collect that offering, these hopeful believers were invited to throw, literally throw, their money directly on the steps of the altar in hopes that God would give it back a hundredfold. And allegedly, as they threw it onto the steps of the altar, they threw it straight into those preacher's pockets. It's tax time. And my husband and I joke every tax season that we chose the wrong profession. I should have been a faith healer. <laughs> I am in the wrong church right now. This, you may have heard of it before, this is called the prosperity gospel. Critics call it the gospel of getting rich. Usually not for the followers usually for the preachers. This is a uniquely American gospel offering an enticing invitation. If you work hard enough and you have enough faith, you'll get what you want. But this gospel, it's very easy for us to judge other Christians and think we're not like that. It isn't limited just to tell evangelists. No, I will argue there is a cult of positivity that pervades our American culture through and through, and we are all susceptible to it. Oh, we Americans love the power of positive thinking. Being positive, we are told by both Pastor Joel Osteen and by Oprah, is the key to success and health and prosperity. Gurus and life coaches and therapists of all stripes peddle in positivity. And so the self-help market is a $10 billion per year industry. And it is so successful because we want it so desperately. Maybe these feel familiar. Maybe you say them or have said them yourself. Where there's a will, there's a way. Just look on the bright side. Think positive, be positive, positive things will happen, yep. Don't let negative people hold you back from your dreams. Everything happens for a reason. God doesn't give you anything more than you can handle. Or this one. I lift up my eyes to the hills, and the Lord will not let my foot be moved. The Lord will keep me from all evil, and he will keep my life from this time on and forevermore. Amen. Hallelujah. I now ask for my offering to be placed right there directly on the steps. I will gladly take it. <laughs> Seriously, though, we want so desperately to believe that if we just have enough faith, if we just put out enough positive vibes into the universe, or if we say enough of the right prayers to God, if we're just good enough, if we exercise enough, if we eat healthy enough and don't eat that Reese's Pieces for Christmas or for Easter, if we're kind enough, if we donate enough money, if we work hard enough, if we do enough, that we will be blessed with long, happy, safe, and comfortable lives. We will live happily after ever, and nothing bad will ever happen to us. And often, when we read today's psalm, Psalm 121, through this lens, 
This is one of those go-to, cross-stitched on a pillow, poetic and positive songs that we love. And that's fitting, because when it was first written, it was, and it is, a song of hope. This was a prayer of protection that Jewish men and women would pray before embarking on any long journey. It was called a psalm for sojourners. Three times a year, imagine this if we had to do this, three times a year, the Jewish people would make a journey by foot from wherever they were to the city of Jerusalem for their annual feasts at the temple. And on their journey, they would see the holy city of Jerusalem literally sitting as a city on a hill on the horizon, for it's the highest point in all of Israel. And they would sing this psalm, I lift my eyes to the hills. And yet, thanks to the wisdom of those who put together our lectionary, this is a psalm we read at Lent of all times. As we walk alongside Jesus as he's making his own journey to Jerusalem, we sing this psalm. The Lord will keep me from all evil, we read as Jesus journeys to the cross. The Lord will keep my life. We remind ourselves, even as we know that Jesus will die, Joel Osteen is one of the most famous of the prosperity gospel preachers. And I find it fascinating and telling that there is no cross displayed in his $75 million per year church. Instead, the church displays a globe in its place. And though they don't say it, they're adamant, we believe in the cross. I have to imagine it's at least in part because the cross is perhaps the most unprosperous symbols of the gospel. The cross is one of those glaring reminders that the gospel of Christ is not glamorous or luxurious or even comfortable. When we see the cross, when we look upon this symbol of execution and persecution and suffering, we remember that if we dare to follow Jesus on this Lenten journey to Jerusalem, we are actually more likely to suffer and to be persecuted. When Paul preaches to the Corinthians, his words are a lot less positive than promises of private jets and yachts and designer handbags. Instead, he says this, five times I received 40 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews and from Gentiles. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Come and follow me. That is a lot less promising. <laughs> when we dare to lift our eyes to the hills, when we dare to see that on the top there is a cross, and we follow anyway. Then, and only then, do we remember the truth of our great gospel. There is a difference between positivity or optimism and hope. Often we use the words interchangeably, but they are as radically different as a globe and a cross. Theologian Henry Nowen describes it like this. Optimism and hope are radically different attitudes. 
Optimism is the expectation that things, like the weather, or human relationships, or the economy, or the political climate, will get better. Hope is the trust that God will fulfill God's promises to us in a way that leads us to true freedom. The optimist speaks about concrete changes in the future. But the person who lives of hope lives in the moment with the knowledge and the trust that all of life is already held in good hands. So is God's promise for us abundant wealth and health and comfort? I'm sorry, but no, you can take your money back. God doesn't stop bad things from happening, author Madeline Langle once said. That's never been part of the promise. The promise is this, I am with you. I am with you now and until the end of time. A retired chaplain I know named Wayne Willis once shared this story about one of his patients. He said she died the way most of us hope to die, in our most optimistic visions. Full after long years, at home with family members at her side. She was one of the most positive people he knew. One of her sons, when he served her orange juice on her last morning, said that she would take a sip, smile, and exclaim, this tastes so good. And when he adjusted her feet with the pillow, she smiled and thanked him and said, that feels so good. And when he opened the curtains to let the sunlight in, she broke into song channeling John Denver's sunshine on my shoulders. When she died, the family discovered a personal manifesto that she had adopted years earlier, typed on red construction paper and taped in the front opening of her Bible. It said this, because the world is poor and starving, go with bread. Because the world is filled with fear, go with courage. Because the world is filled with despair, go with hope. Because the world is filled with lies, go with truth. Because the world is sick with sorrow, go with joy. Because the world is weary of wars, go with peace. Because the world is seldom fair, go with justice. Because the world is full of judgment, go with mercy. And because the world will die without it, go with love. Before she died, she left her minister a final charge to read to any who might attend her service. She said, if by chance you wish to remember me, do it with a kind word or a deed to someone who needs you. Friends, this is the gospel. This is the hope the world so desperately needs, and you need, and I so desperately need. The world needs you. Amen. <laughs>